The hardest part is when you would go to the doctor and every conversation would start with, I'm sorry. And that's, that's the hardest part. And um, having to get your mindset beyond that what you did yesterday isn't going to happen today. And if you want something similar to happen, you've got to figure out a whole new way around doing it. Welcome to Rehabilitation Ships, a new podcast from Mary Freebed Rehabilitation, bringing you real stories of recovery from real patients and real clinicians. Welcome to Rehabilitation Ships, a podcast highlighting the intersection of rehabilitation and relationships. My name's Chris Mills, and I'm your host. We're back with another real story of recovery from real patients and real clinicians. For the next two episodes that we're sinking into, we will be recording at a special location. One of our guests is a bit of a history expert. She'll be taking our listeners for a little journey back in time, for this setting has a major impact on the story. We are talking to Peggy Maniatis, the executive director of the USS Silverside Submarine Museum. Peggy will be sharing a story of how complications following a surgery took her ability to walk and prevented her from sharing her love of the USS Silverside with visitors to the museum. We'll be joined on this podcast by Mark Stevens, a physical therapist at Mary Freebed, who helped Peggy regain her strength and function to safely and successfully return back to her work and mission. This is a two-part story, so let's dive into this first episode of Rehabilitation Ships. Peggy, where are we right now. We are actually recording in some place pretty special. We are in the galley of the USS Silverside Submarine. She is a World War II Gato class submarine that served in the Pacific during World War II. And um, we are currently sitting in Muskegon, Michigan on the channel that connects Lake Michigan to Muskegon Lake. And Mark, what was the first time like for you when you when you came down here? Uh, first time for me was hectic because I had my kids. So the um, uh, so yeah, we were kind of trying to figure out what we needed to do, how we needed to do some uh, therapy with Peggy, and um, the best way to do it re- was really to see it. So uh, Peggy invited us over to to check the place out. My kids loved it, um, but it was good to get, walk through and just from my point of view, I'm just I have no idea how she's going to do this. I have no idea how we're going to achieve um, some of the goals, but. Yeah, here we are. We're sat down here. And our listeners are going to ask me to ask you. You're a physical therapist at Mary Free Bed. Yep. But I love your voice. Where are you from? <laughs> so originally I'm from the UK. So I'm from uh, South Wales. Um, and I spent a good chunk of time in South Wales. That's where my mom lives. Um, and then I, I went to PT school in the University of Liverpool um, in England. And then I moved out here in 2013. Um, and I've been with uh, Mary Freebed now since 2018. And we actually have a, a clinic nearby Muskegon, near the sub, where you work, majority, right? right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so we're, we are in Norton Shore right now. We are looking after the Muskegon population from that from that clinic. And so, Peggy, you kind of said where we are, but just paint the picture of where we're sitting and, and what is all around us in this location. Right now, we are sitting in the pressure hall of the submarine. Um, the submarine is um, sitting in the channel, and um, we are below decks, and we've walked through, or rather I should say climb through, <laughs> several different compartments to get here. We have started out, we were in the forward torpedo room, then we climbed through a hatch, and then we went into the officer's country. Then from there, we went into the con- another hatch and went through the control room, and now we've gone through another hatch, and we are sitting in the galley. It's pretty amazing. And so we're on benches here. This is where the officers would, would eat. and No, and- this is where the enlisted men would have eaten. When we were in officers' country, you saw that there was a wardroom, and that's where the officers had their meals. Um, right now, there's only four tables in here, and um, you would have had... Um, Six people at a table, and so they would have eaten in shifts. And um, the tables, and we're sitting on benches, that everything on a submarine has um, is very compact, and every inch is used for storage. And so um, the benches that we sit on were actually used for storage for ammo. And um, the tables have little lips so that if the um, sea is rough, your plates don't fly, slide off. And so you would eat in rotation. Mark? 
when you started working in physical therapy, did you ever think you would be doing physical therapy on a World War II submarine? <laughs> no chance. <laughs> we talked, me, Peggy and I talked about this. I was like, this is this is a first, and this is probably going to be a last as well. This is is crazy. And I had a had a student as well um, during the time we were going through um, therapy, and it was that's quite an experience for a student, right, starting off your career. Um, yeah. It must be a great paper he wrote after uh-huh. this one, right? I mean, where do you go from there? You know, exactly. I'm in an office, I'm in a clinic. I mean, yeah, can't get Seriously. any better than that. Peggy, where did your love for, for history and things like the submarine and World War II come from? Um, I've always loved history, and um, my undergraduate degree is in history, and I've always wanted to work in the museum industry because I always wanted to tell the stories of the people that came before. And um, But normal how life trajectory is, there wasn't a lot of jobs in the museum industry, so I taught for a while. And so I taught for um, a small college in northern New York in the Adirondacks. And then um, after having a couple of children, could not quite keep up with the pace of all the teaching, and so ended up um, working in a library. And then, But using all of the skills that you have from a library and all my historical skills, when this position opened up, it was just a perfect fit. Can you share just a little bit about how a World War II submarine that served in the Pacific ends up here in a lake in Michigan? The submarine, the USS Silverside submarine came to Muskegon in 1987. Before that, she had served in the Pacific, having many successful war patrols where she defended our nation during World War II. At the end of the war, we obviously had more vessels than what we needed. Some vessels were scrapped, some vessels were sold, some were put into mothballs to be used in case we needed them, and others put in as training vessels. The Silver Size was brought up to um, north of Chicago, to the Great Lakes Training Center, and she was used there for training. She was quickly outdated, though, because by the end of the war, submarines had changed so much, just like so many things. Then she was brought down to be used as a reserve by the reservists, and then when she was finished being used by that, a group of um, submariners wanted to preserve her because so many of the other submarines and the vessels that were used during the war had been scrapped, and they wanted to honor those men and that served on them and all of the people that served in the military. Um, She was in Chicago for a while, and things didn't quite work out the way that they wanted it to. There was going to be built a large um, military park, but unfortunately Chicago went the way many cities did in the 1970s. They had a lot of financial problems, and they couldn't build that park. A group of very dedicated men from the Muskegon area wanted to bring a vessel to Muskegon to honor Muskegon's past as one of the arsenals of democracy during World War II. And um, they applied to get a vessel brought here. They weren't specifically looking to bring a submarine here, but they wanted something that would honor those men and women, whether they were in the military or whether they were at home, providing for the military for the defense of our country. And the Silver Size was brought to Muskegon in 1987. And since that time, it's been our pleasure to preserve her and to serve our mission of honoring the veterans. And we do that through education and preservation. It's very hard to um, honor something that you know absolutely nothing about. And so one of our dearest hopes is when we're here is that when people walk through this, they get an appreciation for what the people did and the fear that they felt and that they're young people and they're facing a really uncertain future and that they gave it all in a time when we don't think much about it anymore. And it takes a lot of work to keep something that was made 80 years ago running. So there's a huge crew of people. There's a big museum outside the submarine. What goes all into keeping this thing afloat? Um, A lot of work, a lot of love, and a lot of passion. Um, We are very blessed with so many wonderful people that volunteer here. We have um, one person um, who has... um, who is in control of making sure that the submarine is maintained. And then we have volunteers and staff members that work with him to make sure that we keep her in the most pristine shape as possible and as functional as possible. Right now, all of her engines, excuse me, two out of her four engines work perfectly, and we start them with quite consistency. We just started them for her 80th birthday in December. And we want to make sure that those engines will continue to be able to be started for the next 80 years. 
And so there's electricity. There's lights on down here. I'm not freezing. I'm The heat's going. So, I mean, there's a bunch of newer stuff that's been put in here. We've got electricity to run the mics and everything. Um, yes. Um, what you see when you walk through the sub is all historic. What you don't see is what we've changed behind the scenes. So in order to keep us up to code, we ran all new electricity, wiring, and things like that. But you don't see it because we left the the historic materials there. You don't see the modern things that we do in order to keep her running. And um, But that's all done. We keep her as historic and looking as accurate as possible when she's there. And one of the challenges with keeping her historic is that um, – She's not handicapped accessible. And because she's in the channel, she's in water, um, we could never make her handicapped accessible. As if, you know, when you go to the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, they have the U505 there. And what they've done, they've done a brilliant job of being able to take her inside and she's suspended. And you can walk right on. And they've cut away areas so that you can get on and walk across into it. Our submarine is in the channel in the water. And so, and in order to maintain her historic integrity, you still have to use ladders and hatches and to make sure she's secure from the water. And um, so there's no way to ever possibly make her handicapped. What we do at the museum for that is that we have a guided tour video that we show inside the museum, which is the actual tour that someone would get if they were able to come out into the vessel. But if you're not able to climb a ladder, you just can't possibly get into her. Or if you're not able to crawl through a hatch, it's just not going to work. And coming through a submarine is not for everyone. So we try, we can't replicate the experience of it, but we still try and give everyone the information that they would have if they could come into the sub. Being the executive director, you have to walk around. You have to see all this. You have to give tours. No, I don't give too many tours. Um, But I do have to walk around and I have to see what everyone else is doing. Um, When this first happened... My staff was great. They're like, oh, we can zoom you right in as we're doing something on the engine so we can explain it to you. Or we can, um, you don't have to come down in the sub anymore. You don't have to be on deck anymore. We had made alternative plans for everything that I could do. Um, We do um, a large ceremony for Memorial Day weekend where we honor the 52 submarines that went down during World War II. It's called Lost Boat Ceremony. And my staff was so good, they made alternative plans because normally the entire ceremony is carried out on deck. They had alternative plans set up for me so that if I could not get onto the deck of the vessel, that they put a podium and the mics and a whole other sound system right on the um, sidewalk outside of the building so that I could participate. That's Peggy Maniatis, the executive director of the USS Silverside Summary Museum, talking about the history of the sub. She's one of our guests for this episode of Rehabilitation Chips, a podcast from Mary Freebed. If you're enjoying this podcast, make sure you rate, review, and subscribe. Now, let's hear from Peggy on how her life drastically changed after complications from a surgery. Well, um, I had um, hip replacement surgery scheduled. And um, COVID hit, and um, the um, elective surgery stopped, and it got postponed several times. And when I was able to have that surgery was July. And um, so I had the surgery. Everything seemed fine. People had told me hip replacement is like the least painful thing out there. And um, I believed them, and I didn't realize that there was anything wrong in the very beginning other than I was falling a lot. And the therapist that came out to the house right after I had left the hospital, was surprised that I couldn't do certain things. And she's like, well, just hang on until you get to outpatient physical therapy, and um, I'm sure it's just something minor and um, it'll be fine. And then I went to visit the outpatient therapist, and she said, this is odd. You know, I've not seen this kind of thing that you couldn't do these following things, and you should have some more feeling when I'm poking you and uh things like that. And so she then got a hold of the surgeon and talked to the surgeon about, um, you know, this didn't seem quite right. And that's when it was probably about five, six weeks afterwards that I got the diagnosis that I had um, nerve, um, nerve damage, femoral nerve damage in my leg. 
Did you know what that was or did you have to research and look it up? I had no idea whatsoever. I knew there was nerves in your bodies, but I, you know, ask me about World War II and I can answer. Ask me if there's a nerve in my leg. I'll say, sure, there's a nerve in my leg. And I knew nothing about it, nothing of what it controlled. Mark, I mean, from your stance, you probably weren't working with her at this point, but what is this and, and how can this happen? The hip area is a really complex um, spot, and especially around the front of the hip, there's the femoral nerve, There's um, you've got your femoral artery, you've got a lot of big things there, and the femoral nerve controls a whole whole chunk of things in your leg. <laughs> so it controls sensation, it controls movement, um, and basically, so Peggy could say exactly this is what it controls because that's the things that don't work anymore. Um, so it's, it's controlling a lot of things. And the, the big one for us was the, was the quads. Um, so the muscles on the front of the leg, that was the, the big one. So, um, not being able to feel that, um, also all the way down to her foot sensation, uh, limited. Um, so Peggy can't feel, uh, when her foot's on the ground. Um, so that was, that's a, a tricky part. And then if she's, um, taking a step without any bracing or support, then her knee buckles um, because she doesn't have the muscles to um, to keep that in control. Um, the other part then would be a hip flexor, so the um, the hip, the the muscle that brings the the leg up um, when you're walking and various things like that. It's it's affected. Uh, Peggy's got this really clever way of moving her leg. Uh, she shouldn't be able to move her leg in one specific way, and she doesn't want me to talk too much about it because she will think about it too much and maybe stop doing it. <laughs> So, so. <laughs> so we, um, but she, she's got, she's got this way of kind of, um, uh, like, uh, rotating her pelvis pretty much when she takes a step. And that's what brings that leg through for it to, for her to be able to walk and do what she does. So Mark, have you, you know, working as a physical therapist in majority outpatient, mm -hmm. right? Have you worked with patients with this similar situation? Um, I've worked with patients who have um, who have had weakness in those areas. Um, I've only worked with a couple of people who have had femoral nerve damage. Um, but a lot of the the presentation of the leg is, is similar to anyone that's that's lost uh, movement for any kind of reason, whether that's uh, spinal cord injury, strokes. Um, it's one side of the body. It's specific movement patterns that they can't do. The the presentation similar to what we've seen before, but the the cause is different. That's that's the great thing with the cause can be different, but the the outlook you've got to look at what people can do and what um, goals people have and what they need to get back to um, to be able to really design your treatment plan. So, Peggy, this is not something you can just have a, a surgery and fix. This is a nerve. I learned that. Yeah. The hardest part is when you would go to the doctor and every conversation would start with, I'm sorry. And that's that's the hardest part. And um, having to get your mindset beyond that what you did yesterday isn't going to happen today. And if you want something similar to happen, you got to figure out a whole new way around doing it. So you said it was hard, but how bad did it get? Were you able to walk at all? How did you get around? Um. I could walk a bit, but my leg would go out from underneath me without any warning. And since I didn't have any feeling, it wasn't like there was some, like a pain and it would go away or there was anything. So I would be taking a step and this suddenly I would go down. Um, so I had a walker. And when I started at Mary Freebed, the calluses on my hands from holding that walker so tight, um, I thought they would never go away um, because that was my lifeline between being able to be upright um, and you feel bad because you're suddenly going from being an independent person to someone that has to rely on someone else all the time to do the basic things of life that you you don't think about something simple like taking a shower by yourself there has to be a whole new way of doing that or um a difficult thing was my inability to get into a car, whether it be from the passenger side or the driver's side. I had to have assistance to get into the car. Um, doing anything around my house that required me to stand for more than a few seconds just didn't happen. Uh, and rolling over in bed was a big thing for you as well, right? Lack of sleep because of that. Um, I could not, when I first went to them, I, they asked me what my three goals were. One was to roll over in bed. One was to figure out how to drive again, 
and the third was to get back on the vessel. When they were able to help me learn how to roll over in bed, it was it changed my life because I was so exhausted because you love your spouse and your spouse helps you into bed, lifts your leg, puts you in bed, gets you all comfortable, and then an hour later you're uncomfortable and you need to move. And the next thing you're doing is poking them saying, please get up, I need to move. And that is so hard. So the most incredible thing they taught me was to move in bed and to roll over and change my own position because then I didn't have to wake up my husband every five minutes to to reposition me. And getting better sleep just gave an, an incredible outlook on life. Before you came to Mary Free Bed and you just found out about, you know, what this was and how you were experiencing how bad it was, where was your your hope level at? Were you hopeless? Did you think, I can get through this? What was going through your mind? Um, there were days when I was really down in the dumps about it because it's really hard to um, be a person that likes to have things done in a certain way, likes to be in control of situations, to learn that you're not in control of anything. Everything in your life is dictated by someone else assisting you. And that's a very hard position to be in. And to know that it would be a permanent situation as opposed to a temporary one. Like after surgery, you expect that someone's going to have to help you for a while. But you expect that you're going to improve and you're going to be able to return the favor to someone else when they're in need and that they need it. And to know that you have just changed the entire dynamics of not just your life, but your entire family's life. And that's something that's very hard to do. And it being pandemic time, too, it's not like your neighbors could just pop by and sit some time and talk to you and cheer you up. You were just pretty much alone. And um, so um, my husband picked up the slack for an awful lot of things. He physically drove me everywhere uh, for nine months. And um, just being able to get back to work um, because you still need someone when you're at work to be the the executive director and so to come back to work it's a long way from the parking lot of the building to where my office is and so um i was very lucky someone from our executive board loaned me an electric chair or motorized chair in order to be able to get around the building without being in the walker and we have an elevator and i had to have my office redone i had the desk taken out of there and i was just um using like a temporary table in there and I would pull in my motorized chair and do what I needed to do and, you know, try and keep up with the, the, the day I had to work around my husband's schedule. So he would drop me off at 6.15 in the morning so that he could be at work by 8. And then I would have to stay until he was finished so he'd pick me up around 6 o'clock at night. And so, it's you know, it's a huge, huge adjustment. And um, you just realize how lucky you are that there's people around you that care and that um, even though you don't want them to help you, you have to let them help you until you get to that point that you can help yourself. Mark, you probably have met a lot of patients that were in Peggy's same situation when it comes to maybe not having a lot of hope and feeling frustrated to be have to rely on so many people to get around what they, something they were able to do before. What's that like when you first start working with a patient in that mindset? Oh, that's a really good question. It's, it's diff, it's tough. It's when you see someone coming in in a situation where they um, were obviously a go-getter before, and all of a sudden they are in a position where they can't do something and it's through um, no fault of their own. Um, then it, it's, it's tough. It's tricky to, to kind of, um, to think, well, well, what can we do? How can we get you get you back to those situations? And and for Peggy, especially with the injury she had, I can't reverse that um, as a therapist. I can't reverse that injury. It's just trying to figure out modifications and trying to figure out ways to help her be able to achieve those those goals. So from from me as a therapist, I always try and look at um, okay, let, let's what can we achieve quickly what let's let's find a goal let's find something that we can do quickly that is going to show you that there is potential um to come out and one of the, the first thing for us with peggy was getting her in the right brace 
Um, cause when she came in, first of all, she had a, just a, a knee immobilizer. Uh, it was a strap basically that was, was on her leg, blocking her knee and stopping her from, uh, buckling, but it didn't fit. Um, by the time she walked from the, uh, from the waiting room to the eval room, it was already down by her ankle. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, well, that, that brace isn't going to work for you. Let's, let's figure out what brace we need. So we pretty quickly got you set up with the O&P office with Mary Freebed, uh, so orthotics and prosthetics, and and they um, put you into a knee immobilizer, which, one, fit well. Um, stayed put. Stayed put, uh, locked your knee out. But the problem with that brace was it locked her out completely. So she, when she was locked, she was locked. And then she had to unlock it. There was a couple of hinges on the knee, unlock it to be able to sit down. Um, I think Peggy said the amount of uh, pants she put holes in and various things from those locking pins were was crazy. Um, but... I was destroying a pair of pants nearly daily. And at first I'm like, oh, it's, you know, um, and people said, just wear a pair of sweatpants. I'm like, no, that doesn't fit in my life to wear uh-huh. sweatpants. Yeah. So it's those things. It's saying, well, that, that doesn't really fit fit with my life. Okay, so let's figure out what, what is gonna fit, what is gonna gonna work and um and that I think that was the the first moment where I think we got to a point where okay that brace fits. It's doing what I need it to do. Okay, I can actually do some things now. He picked up on something that I said in passing that I didn't even realize that I had said, but it was a frustration because as a director of a museum you go to a lot of meetings and it was wonderful to be able to get to the meeting. But then everyone else would sit down and I would still be trying to unhook my brakes so that I could actually sit. So everyone else is already sitting in the meeting and starting. Everyone's waiting for me because I still can't sit down. And those little things that make you, you know, not part of everything that's going on. You must feel separated in some ways where this this injury is now like bringing you apart from your your normal life. It is. And you would think that, you know, in our society, you know, we're very used to people with disabilities and we're very used to people that are going through things. But still, it's it's hard. It's very standoffish. And sometimes it's I don't know if people just don't know how to react to you or if people are just trying to be empathetic or if they're just uncomfortable or what it is. But there's always that standoffish. Yes. You're listening to Rehabilitation Ships, a podcast from Mary Freebed about the intersection of rehabilitation and relationships. Guests on this podcast are Peggy Maniatis, the Executive Director of the USS Silverside Submarine Museum, and physical therapist Mark Stevens. Next up, we hear how Peggy got connected with Mark at Mary Freebed. Peggy, when did you first hear about Mary Freebed in start looking in that direction for some therapy? Um, I was not quite ready to accept my diagnosis when I first got it and um, was told, we're sorry, you'll be using a walker for the rest of your life. And so I went for a second opinion. And I ended up going to um, Chicago for that second opinion. And in Chicago was where they told me about Mary Freebed. It was something that was in my own backyard, and I didn't even know it existed. I had seen your cutesy signs along the highway, (laughs) but, you know, I didn't understand, you know, what you guys did or anything like that. And I'd never heard of a rehab hospital before or anything that to, to do with it. And so when Chicago, they had told me that there are places that you can go that they know that they can't change what's wrong with you but they can help you get the most out of your life again. And they recommended Mary Freebed. And so I contacted them and um, I got an appointment. And um, I think it's about a year ago now. I think it was either late February or beginning of March when I started going out there. Mm -hmm. And you saw Dr. McKinney. I saw Dr. McKinney first. Yeah. And um, I remember her looking at my leg and it was kind of stuck in one position and her poking at it, seeing if it would actually move at all. That's a normal medical thing, right? To just just poke at stuff. Well, yeah, because because of the because um, of the nerve damage, there's a bunch of tests you can do from uh, reflex tests. Like we have to check sensation because she's lost sensation. So you've got different sensations that you'll feel from different parts of the nerves, and so you've got like hot and cold, sharp and blunt. 
um, vibration, all of these different things. So like the ducks will check out all of those things. Okay, so is sharp good? Is blunt good? Can you feel soft, uh, like light touch? Can you feel deep touch? Can you feel heat? vibration can you feel all of those things and it gives us a good idea of what's there and, and peggy's pretty much nothing nothing <laughs> so so where at from what point of your leg do you just not feel anything um about an inch from the joint going down i can feel the joint but i can't feel anything below that i have a small strip of um, feeling along the exterior of my left leg and then some feeling across the tops of my toes and that's it so if i stub my toe i feel it but um Mm -hmm. um the rest of it i don't feel anything for with not feeling that was she able to still have movement is she can control anything below that or is everything from above can control a few things on the back of the leg so hamstrings still got some hamstrings there she can move her foot up and down um that was there as well um, and then uh, glutes, so your hip extensors, they, they're still good. Um, so it's all the things on the front um, that, are, that are causing the most problems, so the quads being the biggest one, quads and hip flexor. So when someone comes to Mary Freebed for rehabilitation, physical therapy, whatever they might need, what all goes into checking her out? So mm-hmm. she doesn't just go right to you as a physical therapist. There's more in this evaluation. Right. So she went um, with Dr. McKinney first. Dr. McKinney um, is a rehabilitation she's physician. A, yeah. So she's a physiatrist and she um, uh, works in our Muskegon office as well. Then she kind of, she contacted me. Uh, I've got a lady that's uh, got a femoral nerve injury. Um, this is what I've seen. Um, can we, can we bring her in? Yeah, great. So she, so then uh, Peggy came in for an evaluation with me. I did a bunch of the same things <laughs> that Dr. McKinney did just to see um, where where we were at. Um, and then part of my assessment is okay, where where are our deficits? What are they? Um, what can't what like can't you do? What can you do? What do you need to do um, to be able to do that? And then that's when Peggy dropped the bombshell that she needs to get into a submarine. Um, so that was yeah, that was one of those okay. Um, yeah, that was the three goals. It was, I want to be able to roll over in bed, drive my car and get into a submarine. I was like, someone's, is this true? <laughs> is this true? Unique the job description. Right. right. I just love that joke there too, by the way, Mark, the bombshell. That was, that was, that was pretty good. <laughs> um, and it threw me off. Now I gotta look at my questions again. <laughs> That's where we will end this episode of Rehabilitation Chips. Check out our next episode when Peggy and Mark will be back, and they'll share how they started working together in physical therapy with the goal of getting Peggy back into the submarine. And since we've recorded these episodes, Peggy has taken on a new opportunity. She's now leading the Wright Museum of World War II in New Hampshire. You're listening to Rehabilitation Chips, a podcast from Mary Freebed Rehabilitation. Every month, we'll share amazing stories just like this highlighting the intersection of rehabilitation and relationships. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear your feedback and any story ideas you might have for future episodes. Send us a note at podcast at maryfreebed.com. If you, a family member, or friend may be in need of physical therapy or any other kind of rehabilitation, visit maryfreebed.com. And trust me, you don't need to have a submarine to ask for Mary. The expert team can help you with any aches, pains, or strains. And with that, I'm Chris Mills, your host for Rehabilitation Chips. And until next time, thanks for listening and stay well.